Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Lauren Horan. Um, if you are just joining us, thank you for um, your participation today in our webinar. Um, we are going to be talking with um, three panelists along with Tam Pham, who is um, an MLA. She's my colleague at MLA. So I'm really excited for you to judge her. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Tam Pham. She's going to set up today's conversation and introduce you to our panelists. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome, everyone. I'm a managing director in the in-house counsel recruiting group at Major Lindsay in Africa as part of the San Francisco team. For the past five years with MLA, I've had the pleasure of helping our clients in the Bay Area and globally find stellar legal talent for their in-house teams. I'm really excited for this discussion. Given the number of innovative tech clients we have, the subject of generative AI has garnered so much interest and press since the launch of ChatGPT. And I realized I needed to learn more. What better way to do that than to call upon experts in the field? I'm pleased to introduce to you our exceptional panelists. Cecilia Zinitti currently serves as general counsel and head of business development for Replit, the world's fastest growing developer platform with over 20 million users and is the creator of Ghostwriter, the generative AI for software development. Before Replit, she was founder and principal of Zeniti Law, where she advised a range of venture-backed and other companies, including health tech unicorn, a global ed tech company, and an HR tech provider. Before Zeniti Law, Cecilia was general counsel and corporate secretary at Avki and Bloom Tech. Mo Metina is a director and associate general counsel, AI product at Meta, where she leads the product legal team responsible for supporting the AI business across research, product development, and responsible AI teams. Prior to joining Meta, Mo was corporate counsel and director of business affairs at Pandora, where she oversaw the company's royalty rate court proceedings in music copyright litigation. Before going in-house, Mo was managing associate at Oric, where she practiced intellectual property litigation and counseling focusing on copyright, trademark, trade secret matters. Bobby Gajar is an intellectual property litigation partner at Cooley. Bobby's practice is focused on counseling leading companies in trademark, trade dress, copyright, right of publicity, and false advertising litigation. He has handled dozens of high stakes litigation and appellate matters for some of the top brand owners in the world. And many of his cases have helped create legal precedent. He speaks and writes extensively on IP and internet issues, has co-written treatises on rights of publicity and trademark law, and has been quoted as an expert in numerous publications. In recent days, Bobby has been immersed in the world of generative AI, including litigating cases relating to copyright and trademark, as well as speaking extensively as an AI subject matter expert. Let's talk to these experts. Because um, not all of us tuning in are well versed in this topic, uh, Cecilia and Bobby are going to give us a quick primer on what generative AI is. Let's start, Cecilia. Great, thanks, Tam, and thanks everyone for joining. This is a topic I'm incredibly passionate about, so very uh, excited to dive in. So what is generative AI? So let's start with what is AI? So artificial intelligence is basically the use of computers or compute to mimic human intelligence in some way. Lots of ways to do this. So for example, an application of AI that Amazon, my former employer used, was figuring out exactly what size box for your particular package. You might have noticed you get something from Target, the box is randomly too big. Well, guess what? Amazon's applied a bunch of algorithms to make that judgment for every product. So that's regular AI. Generative AI is possible because of recent developments in technology. So essentially spending many years on analyzing lots of data plus advances in compute. So the actual computing power to figure out, um, to do the quantity of mathematical analysis required has unlocked the ability to actually predict. So generate. So generative AI comes from generate. It's where you can actually create the next step. So essentially, instead of trying to tell if a picture 
is of one thing or another. The famous example being hot dog or not, which is actually something that's used in the field of computer vision. It can actually create a picture of a hot dog when given a verbal prompt. And so generative AI can be used across a number of fields. So art is the one that gets <laughs> a lot of play. So create a picture of this water bottle in the style of uh, Picasso, um, create a picture of the Pope wearing Balenciaga, which has got to be one of the best things. It's so good. I've got to show you. <laughs> so that's art. Um, there's also text. So if you're here, you're most likely a lawyer. I tell everyone I'm a wordsmith. My medium is words. <laughs> I use Grammarly Generative AI, which tells me I've written 10 million words in the last two years, which is kind of crazy. In any event, Large language models and word prediction is also getting a ton of attention. That's what you think of with ChatGPT and BARD. Third category would be more like creating slide decks or creating any kind of work. So these different, I guess, ways you can apply generative AI, those are just different vertical domains and you're gonna see generative AI across all of them. My company happens to do it for code um, which when you really think about it, code is really specialized language, right? There's a certain format. You might have a for loop or you might have, you know, writing a function. It's very sort of defined. Of course, this is a legal webinar. So contracts also very structured, right? You could learn on all the contracts of, I don't know, Nike or something and, you know, be able to actually analyze what kinds of um, clauses or the limits of their IP risk or what have you, and be able to create clauses in sort of a pull down fashion. Um, so that's my quick overview of generative AI. I do have a fun one, um, the chihuahua or blueberry <laughs> um, that people always uh, think of. So this is the kind of task that for a computer would have been very difficult even just 10 years ago. About five years ago, predictive vision AI got really good, but it still has a hard time with this. Um, and what you need to do is train the computer to actually see um, hundreds of images like this. And a human would say, okay, this is a chihuahua, this is a blueberry muffin, and so on. Um, that's actually one of the canonical problems in um, sort of pre-AI. So that was a whirlwind, but uh, hopefully conveyed my enthusiasm for AI. It, it does. Let me add, uh, let me add to that, uh, if we could allow my sharing of slides. Thank you. So I'm going to demonstrate a few uh, of the platforms that are being used to create content with AI. Can everybody, if everyone can see my screen right now, this is a photograph of a, this is the prompt we put into uh, Mid Journey, a photograph of a man in a suit standing on a sandy beach. You can read the prompt. And this tool created this image. Now, this isn't a photograph of an actual uh, person. This isn't an actual photograph of an ocean. It was created and imagined by AI. And I've used this in other presentations as symbolic of the tsunami of creativity and the challenges that are facing us due to the advent of AI. And we think it's a pretty cool image. Uh, AI can create art. Uh, this is an oil painting representing the societal impact of generative AI. Uh, you could imagine this hanging in a, your law firm or your uh, office at work, and this was created in a few clicks of a button using one of the image generating tools. Uh, AI can create photo photorealistic uh, portrayals of people that, that didn't actually occur. So this is a, a picture of a one-on-one -on -one game uh, between former President Trump and President Biden. And, and, and I think most of the audience can tell this is not real <laughs> for a myriad of reasons, but uh, it does a pretty good job, again, with just a few easy prompts. Uh, this one's a bit longer, um, but ChatGPT, uh, which is publicly available uh, uh, and, and a very, very powerful tool, is very good at coding, writing stories, poetry, music, synthesizing. And here we add it, ask it to write a children's story about an English bulldog named Monty who gets transported to another galaxy. And so it does it. And so for those of you who haven't played around with the technology, I think everybody on this panel would encourage you to do so. 
you're going to hear that there are limitations, there are some dangers, you need to go in with your eyes wide open. But the power is obvious. It wrote this story, it's a pretty good story. We've asked it to rewrite the story in the style of Dr. Seuss, and it can do that. It knows what that means. It's trained on Dr. Seuss's books. And so uh, for those who are able to read the screen, you'll see it's, it's a cute, uh, shorter version of the story. Uh, then we asked it to write a cease and desist letter to, uh, on behalf of the rights owners to Dr. Seuss. And it does a pretty good job of that too. And I think this is interesting for the audience to see, so we'll let this play out. It just shows the, the and, it, and look how quickly it, it did this. Now, I'm not suggesting that you use ChatGPT to write demand letters but you'll find that there are ways that you can use it to do things more efficiently. So those are a few examples. Now, one, you've all heard of ChatGPT. I think it's important to explain what GPT means. GPT is Generative Pre-trained Transformers. Essentially, these are large language models and a framework for generative AI, the chat component being that you can chat and interact with the tool. And so it's ChatGPT and the ready availability of this technology for consumption by folks like yourselves and, and, and us that makes this different. AI has existed for years. Generative AI has existed. What has not existed is commercially available products that allow us to use it so easily and readily. Thank you. That is really, really helpful. Um, even in my research, I, you know, I, I think it's 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 nice to get that sort of concise um, definition. Thanks both. Um, so we can see how excited Tatulia and Bobby are about generative AI. Um, what about you, Mo? How do you feel about it? I mean, I think uh, just listening to both Bobby and Tatulia talk about like what we know generative AI can do right now is incredibly exciting. Um, there are so many interesting use cases and um, future products that you can envision. I think where I get most excited is about the stuff that we still don't know about. Um, and, you know, we have research teams at Meta working on various different projects involving generative AI, some of which, you know, have been published. Um, but I know that when OpenAI um, launched ChatGPT, like that was just, I think, really a pivotal moment um, when it comes to generative AI, mainly because it put the technology not only at the hands of like tech consumers, but at the hands of like everyone you can imagine, like everyone is talking about this technology. Um, and that's just in the use cases that we like know of today. It's like everyone is, there's a lot of excitement around it. Um, but I'm really interested to see how this technology can be used um, in areas like healthcare or climate change to kind of help um, approach like difficulties and complexities that are found there. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of real potential um, that these technologies will be able to unblock for us. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about it. I'm excited to see what the um, new use cases come up and what you know startups and other companies are gonna be working on um, to advance uh, generative AI. Yeah, I, I mean, it sounds from all three of you guys, it's clear that AI will revolutionize creative industries, right? Like music, art, writing, um, and that's pretty obvious. How do you think it affects other industries? Um, I know Mo mentioned, you know, healthcare. Um, Tatilia, like what, what other industries do you think it will really impact? Yeah, so uh, I could talk about what I, I'm pretty deep on, which is software development. So Replit is a software development platform. We have 22 million developers globally, you know, millions of users a month, essentially coding in the browser, similar to writing, you know, Gmail, email in, in the cloud. And the application of generative AI to that, what we've seen from users, um, essentially just the ability to complete code We've seen it take people who are not developers like me can be developers. So literally I can provide a prompt, create a basic workout app, and it's a real app. It's not a skin of an app. It's an app that would take your workouts and record them in a database. So people who are not developers becoming developers. People who are developers um, get anywhere from 
we've seen reports of up to 10x improvements. So there was a tweet from Paul Graham this morning that he said it was 10x. People who are the mythical 10x developer, and you know, people talk about this with lawyers, people that are just that much more productive, that much faster at writing briefs, whatever it is. People who are 10x developers, even getting a marginal improvement of 10% speed faster, um, you know, you can imagine the extremely deep impact of that. So the billable hour, people have been talking about the death of the billable hours since I've been practicing. Like, I don't think it's dying. However, am I going to pay a first year for an hour to write a demand letter when I could get it in five minutes, make three adjustments I'd make on outside counsel's work anyway? No. So I do think it will accelerate the trend of um, a little bit more self-serve on the on the in-house side. But that's something that, you know, good lawyers like Bobby have been adjusting to for, for a really long time, right? So um, I think the impact will be, it's not going to be the AI is going to take our jobs. I don't think that's the case. I think it's going to be, if you don't use AI, you are at a disadvantage and your business and your career will eventually suffer. So I do have a funny example. You know, I, I talked about being a wordsmith. If people want to see, like I have both Grammarly AI for email and um, I'm part of the Google Labs beta, uh, which is a public beta for Google's generative AI. So I can show an example, but essentially, I don't want to understate the impact. I think it's like the internet. I mean, you can imagine for a while people had, you know, WordPerfect when I was a clerk, I had WordPerfect and whatever, but like literally the ability to collaborate that the cloud provides, that level of step change is what I, is what we're going to see. Oh, you, people want to see the demo? Do they want to see the email demo? <laughs> I could show it. All right. Um, I don't know the update. What do you think, Tam? Should I show the, the email demo? It's pretty quick. Uh, sure. All right, here. All right, so I have a fifth grader. Very exciting. She's getting promoted to middle school. This is an email from her teacher. Teacher says there's going to be a clap out ceremony. It's all very exciting. And let me see what I want to reply. So I have Grammarly pre-installed in the browser. I can hit reply quickly. And then I get Grammarly asking me, what kind of email do you want to write? I want to acknowledge receipt, agree, confirm attendance. Let's acknowledge receipt. And there you go. Insert, send, thanks, and letting me know. Thanks again. We're looking forward to attending, blah, blah, blah. I can hit send and done. Now, I went a little slower because I was doing the demo. But you can imagine that if I was doing this myself, that was three taps. Um, that was impressive. Maybe two. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a mom, like my school, I have four kids, like all the schools are spamming me all the time. Like I need an AI just to tell me which to respond to. And then if they can respond for me and make me look more thoughtful, like, I mean, hell, like that productivity, even in my personal life, like I, it, it feels like a, like a big advantage. So I see that playing out in basically every field. Wow. I love that. <laughs> I need, I need an assistant. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, Mo, I wanted to ask you um, your thoughts about how AI is being used in-house and specifically at Facebook. Um, I know there, you know, some non-public information, but anything that you're able to share um, that is sort of, you know, being used at Facebook and, and how are you in the legal department tackling sort of those legal policy considerations? Yeah, so I will say Meta is definitely not new um, to the AI space. Uh, it's really a, a part of the fabric of the company, um, and it's been so for a really long time. Um, we use AI across the business for things like ranking content, um, recommendations, content moderation um, to help like identify and remove uh, co um, content standard violating content um, and more. Uh, so you know we've been using ai for for a very long time and, and across the business we joke um that you know all lawyers at meta are ai lawyers because you know the ai is really the foundation on which um, many of our features and products are built on um with respect to gen ai there's a, there's definitely a lot of excitement at the company um i, I know that there have been public statements made about um meta and investments in gen ai um you know those are all very much TBD. Um, we do have a, a newly formed generative AI org um, that is working on, you know, various new ideas, um, which is really exciting. Um, and we are, you know, exploring and testing some of these concepts already. Um, 
for example, um, I think some features and tools have been rolled out for advertisers, a certain advertisers and like a testing basis um, to help, you know, generate backgrounds for advertisements um, or, you know, provide different aspect ratios, things like that. Um, and so, you know, we're definitely um, very excited about this space. In terms of, you know, legal goals involvement um, in, in kind of wrapping our arms around um, this, this technology, um, generally speaking at Meta, you know, we have a, a pretty large like cross-functional group of folks that review, um, you know, new or updated features or products. Um, and, and that involves people look across legal, um, sometimes multiple stakeholders, um, but also like policy and, and civil rights, um, comms, um, and, you know, sometimes even more stakeholders than that. Um, and so um, we, we're taking it like day by day, um, step by step, and just making sure that the right stakeholders are involved when it comes to reviewing um, these tools and, and their use cases. Um, for, for Bobby and, and Chichuia, do you want to add anything uh, with respect to, you know, the, ch the biggest challenges you see uh, for legal departments, um, you know, judging from what you see being used? Uh, I'll, I'll, if, I'll answer that a little bit more broadly, Tam, because it's a good question. Every, every day and certainly every week, I'm getting outreach from clients of the firm in every industry. And they want to talk about AI generally. And I think that that signals to me that legal departments are having these problems, although the outreach comes not only from general counsel, but from CTOs, CEOs, CMOs, et cetera. And the question is usually a very basic one. What should we know and what are the dangers? And it's fascinating to me how quickly the thinking has evolved. Three months ago, four months ago, there were companies saying, and issuing policies indicating that their employees were not allowed to use AI at all. Don't use it, it's blocked, there'll be repercussions if you do. Uh, almost all of the clients I speak to now are permitting it, but then they come to us and say, what guide push, post should we put around the use of AI? What policies? And so in, con in conjunction with our uh, tech transactions group, we've put together a model policy that we send to clients and potential clients, and then we're often engaged to hone it into their particular use case. Are they in the healthcare industry? There's some additional concerns. Legal industry, software, you name it. So that is a, a an initial inquiry, an initial project that we have with almost every one of our touch points, and these are clients that I talk to uh, and potential clients that I talk to. And so it must be perplexing the announced legal folks. What should I do? How should we do it? And then relatedly, it's who and what. So the who is who at the company should be using generative AI for work-related tasks and which or what platforms they should use. We've all been talking about ChatGPT. I think that right now is the gold standard among AI platforms and products. Will it be in five years? Who knows? There's, there's a myriad of others. Um, I think Chachilia could name a dozen or two, so could I. We've had clients ask us, what do you think about XYZ tool? And the first, and I'm not a technologist, I'm not gonna be able to evaluate whether it's a good tool. I don't know what data set it trained from, unless they tell me uh, I can use it. But what I usually start by doing is looking who's behind it, the reputable company, and what are the terms of service? And so I mentioned that because one of the first things people need to do before they allow their uh, clients or employees to use a particular tool is to look at the terms of service for that tool. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into this, I think, uh, later in the presentation. But what you share with AI is, imp is important. That's the input upon which it's going to react. Well, some platforms are going to take that input and take for themselves a license to whatever you've fed into the AI platform. So just imagine that if you had an employee share the company's trade secrets, crown jewels, uh, proprietary content, creative content with a platform for the purposes of generating new content, and, and they have unwittingly given a license to a particular platform that says in their terms of service, whatever you put in to our platform, we have a royalty-free license to use and train from. And so 
looking at the terms and ser of the service and the way the platforms work is incredibly important to those in-house counsel out there. Uh, some of the bigger platforms uh, have had terms of services written and rewritten and revised, and we, as outside counsel, approve of many of them. Uh, we just have to explain them to our client, but there are a number of platforms and tools out there that I cannot recommend that our clients use because of what they say they will do with the data, or maybe just as alarming, what they don't say about that. Oh, that's really interesting. As just a follow up on on that, um, you know, you're the, a, the the IP expert. You know, what are those big risks when companies are using that generative AI with respect to IP? And then I think you're high, litigating some high profile uh, cases right now, right? My firm is, and some of my colleagues uh, are, and and I'm dealing with these issues every day for clients in the pre-litigation posture. It, it, there's a long answer to that question, but I'll start off with a short one and then we can explore it all together. There is a threshold issue about what and who owns AI-generated content. That's an interesting issue to me. That's what I geek out as, as a, an IP attorney. And you create this beautiful content using AI. It could be a screenplay, it could be the images that you saw earlier in the presentation. What if I wanted to own those? Do I own those? I created them, do I own them? And it, it, it's a little bit more than the word own. It's, is it copyright protectable? Could I enforce those rights against anybody? And right now, to the surprise of perhaps a lot of people uh, in, this, in this seminar, in this presentation, the Copyright Office's view at the moment, and I have to say that because I think the view is subject to change, is that where you simply type in a basic prompt into an AI platform, like the one I did earlier in ChatGPT, and it generates content, since that content was created by AI, not a human, it is not copyrightable. Let me repeat that. Because copyright must be created by it, Copyrighted works must be created by humans, and because AI-generated works are inherently not created by a human, set aside that a human generated the platform, uh, helped train it, set aside that you, the human, put in a small prompt, Copyright Office's view is that you did not have sufficient control over the output. All you did was you put in a few instructions. Now, by analogy, Tam, if you hired me as an artist to paint a portrait of your family, uh, I'm a human, <laughs> I would paint the portrait, I would own the copyright, and I would assign it to you. I could sell it to you. And then you'd have to write to display it and do whatever you want with it. You can't do that with AI because AI is not a human. And so right now, the, the law in, in, in the Ninth Circuit, the Copyright Office's view is a human can only, only a human can own a copyright. And AI is not a human. And so, Ownership of AI outputs, what comes out of the platform, is a very big issue. And so think about how that could affect companies using AI. Think about a company that makes its revenue through programming, through articles. Of course they want to use AI to generate content and generate it quickly and, and profusely. But at, at what risk, at what cost? And so what we what I found myself doing is advising clients how to how to walk that line because what's unsettled Tim is what level of input do you need to provide an AI platform for someone like the cop it's uh, an entity like the copyright office to say you did enough to control the output so therefore you own it and, and there's a an example that I've spoken about and I'll just touch on very briefly here, there was an artist who created a comic book using Midjourney, the image generating AI tool, and they were responsible for the text. So imagine a comic book with a bunch of images and text accompanying those images. The artist selected and arranged the order of the images and claimed that they also refined the images. So not only did they have to 
put in the prompts, they selected which images went where, which images they liked, they discarded the others, they refined some of them. To make a very long story short, the Copyright Office held that because the work was created by AI, all such components were not copyrightable. What that meant was that the, the artist's copyright registration was limited to the text that she created and the selection and arrangement of the images. In effect, that meant and means that somebody could take those same images in her comic book, rearrange them in a different order, and follow the copyright office to logic, she would not be able to sue for copyright infringement. So take that example and apply it to other situations. Software code, uh, a, a, a novel, a motion picture created by AI. These are some of the dangers. And I'll, I'll close this part of the conversation by saying, this is not the end all be all, this isn't the final word. This is actually the first word from the Copyright Office. They've now issued a circular that talks about human authorship. But now an interesting issue being presented is, what if you draw the first cut of the image and then you feed it into an AI tool and have it enhance it, beautify it, make it something more photorealistic? Copyright lawyers would all agree that your drawing, your handwritten drawing, is yours, it qualifies for copyright protection. Would you own the refined version that is output from the AI tool? That is being tested right now at the Copyright Office. The argument being that unlike typing in a few words and having it generate a novel, this is the artist's actual drawing fed into an AI platform, and what comes out of it looks an awful lot like that drawing, just better or different. Wow, Bobby, thank you. That was super, super helpful and um, be interesting to see what the Copyright um, Office comes out on that decision. Uh, Mo, I have a question for you with respect to sort of the ability for, you know, uh, at GCs and counsels in-house. How, like, how important is it for in-house attorneys to become AI experts and how do they develop that expertise? Yes, I think it's a great question, and I think Cecilia hit on this a little bit earlier, um, and I apologize for the background noise. I think um, there's some gardening happening outside. Um, so I think it's really, really important as AI, as again, like we're at this pivotal moment where AI is becoming um, kind of a bigger and bigger part of everyone's everyday lives. Like it, it, it's increasing productivity, you know, efficiencies. Um, and as Shelia said, if you're if you're not keeping up with the times, and you know, that's when you'll probably be, be in trouble. And I think it's very true of even for like even for lawyers to make sure that they're staying on top of um, the legal trends when it comes to AI. And there are there are a number of potential legal issues, and, and we just hit on one of um, many of them. Um, and so I think there are various ways to stay on top of kind of what's happening in the AI space. Um, given that, you know, these new generative AI tools have taken the world by storm, there are even more resources than you can imagine um, at your fingertips. I think if you just Google, you know, AI and the law, you'll get, I don't know, like, pages and pages of search results um, where you can just click on one and start kind of diving right in. But if you want something more formal, I know that like um, MIT offers like a six week course on AI. Um, Coursera offers a number of AI and law courses. Um, there are a ton of podcasts um, on, uh, on AI right now. Um, Lex Friedman, who is, um, you know, a prolific AI podcaster, um, uh, he has a bunch of different segments on AI, um, including some from you know folks that work at Meta. Um, Hard Fork is another really good resource. They've had a number of podcasts um, on AI, um, so something worth checking out. Um, really, like I think just leveraging Google search um, will get you kind of write what you need, like what you need, and then you can take it from there if you want something more formal or if you want like a um, to, to pick up a class at like a local university or something like that. And I know that um, given how much attention is on this space, there are more and more resources available. 
Cecilia, I wanted to ask you um, for, with respect to sort of some of the ethical considerations. For me, I think, you know, the things that pop up that concern me a little bit immediately uh, when we're talking about this is uh, are things like bias, discrimination, fake news. Um, what are the biggest concerns for you and are they insurmountable? I know you're a big fan, but I mean, you know, what are your concerns? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So on this one, I think there's a couple ways you can look at it. So for me, I've been lucky enough to work on kind of the forefront of technology for most of my career. And I've seen these concerns kind of like with every sort of turn, right? Internet was the same thing. Social media was the same thing, you know, even search. Um, and what I would hearken back to is like when photography first came out, like literally like Kodak in like 1880 or whatever, you can find magazine articles being like, is this taking my soul? You know, how do you know, whatever. And like, similarly, I was talking with my father-in-law that when heart transplants came out, it was like, oh, are they a real person? And, you know, now a heart transplant, it's almost like blase, right? So I see this as a natural evolution. And with respect to particular issues, you know, bias, discrimination, fake news, what I would say is like, similar to you know perhaps meta or others algorithms when you're learning on human behavior which is what this is trained on you will reflect humanity and sometimes that makes me sad so the famous example you know was from my former employer amazon created effectively an ai to go through resumes and guess what it was sexist af like it really was it literally would see you know pta on a resume ding the person but guess what that's what humans do or did in their training data. And, you know, I, I hope that we get to a future where that's not the case, but I don't see the actual generative AI being so different. Um, I mean, I think the level of potential fake that you can have, like, I will say this one is like such a fun example that I just have to share it because it's hilarious. The, um, the dripped out, uh, the Balenciaga Pope, I swear to you, I saw that on my Twitter and I circulated it before I realized it was fake. So that was one that, that was a that was a good example. But in terms of like what we do about it, Mark Andreessen, if you're super interested in this topic, Mark Andreessen did a 20,000 word essay um, last week in defense of AI. Um, his position, you know, you could argue is a bit self-serving because he references his portfolio companies. Um, but he makes a really good point on this like historical thing that every change in tech, you know, fire, internet, all these things, um, you know, things can be used for good or bad. Um, he makes a super interesting point, which is that generative AI could be used for good, right? You know, for organizing, for marketing your nonprofit, for recognizing others' AI. Um, so on the policy side, there's lots of interesting discussion. Sam Altman presented, you know, before Congress on some of these issues very, um, you know, eloquent way. Um, but I think the, the way that... Um, like I only see the technology getting better, including getting better on these issues. I I chuckled when Cecilia talked about the resistance to technology. There was a, a very old case from the late 1800s that established that photographs could be protected under copyright law. I mean, back then the discussion was, what is a human doing? They're just clicking this contraption and it's creating this image. Why is this image protectable? And the Copyright Act was amended to allow for protection of copyright, uh, sorry, to allow for protection exactly. of photographs. Well, and, and I was at the Ninth Circuit when we decided the Naruto case. Does everybody know the Naruto case? Of oh my God, it's amazing. All right, let, let me share a screen, Pam. I got to show it. It's so good. All right, do I have the, the power to share screen? Let's see. All right. There you go. All right, so this selfie, is this not the most amazing selfie of a monkey you've ever seen? All right, so the photographer for this was denied the copyright because the monkey took the selfie, even though he spent hours in the jungle getting this all set up. But I think like Bobby's point is a really good one, which is that like as lawyers, you have the capability just as like an IP matter and courts have the capability to apply precedent just like for anything else. So anyway, hopefully I made your day with the monkey selfie. That's <laughs> hilarious. I love it. 
one of my one of my colleagues uh, was involved in that litigation. She argued at the Ninth Circuit, and it was an interesting argument. And and that is one of the cases. And we are now in the Ninth Circuit. We're in one of the jurisdictions that have clearly held you you need to have a human um, create the work to have it protected by copyright. Uh, if Congress wants to change that. They can, and, and maybe they will, um, but for now, that is the law. Um, and then piggybacking on what Mo said, I think you can find endless content on AI out there. I know my firm, I've been pushing my firm to very big tech and forward-thinking firm, and so I have been pushing and pushing and pushing to develop our AI page. It's finally launched, but some of my colleagues are putting out free content for, for um, companies. There was a great Cooley Go article by some of my colleagues on top 10 things in-house counsel should know. I, 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 I hate to only plug my firm. I know other firms are, are doing that as well, but look for the firms you work with or firms you want to work with to keep you in the loop on the latest developments. Um, I, I know that we're developing a lot of content in this area. I've done podcasts, but it's important for you as in-house counsel to stay up on the latest and greatest. And as I mentioned earlier about the terms of use, which I find critical uh, to the use of any AI platform, they're changing. Uh, when I did a first presentation nationally on AI earlier this year, I think it was in, in January, from that presentation to the one I did in February, terms of service of two of the major AI platforms had changed. Then from February to March, again, um, some of them have, have not changed since, but uh, there is a lot of evolution in this area. And as um, Julia mentioned, there are subcommittee hearings on AI, there are different politicians putting forth their AI regulation bills, there's a whole discussion about is AI dangerous, uh, uh, dangerous to humanity, uh, and, and should we regulate the development of AI, and so you can't go a day without seeing it in the headlines, uh, and, and maybe deserve it so. But I think one of the points you're making that I would emphasize is like as experienced in-house counsel or really any in-house counsel, like these are not new problems. Like I was reviewing terms of use for random software people were using when I was, you know, a baby corporate counsel. And it's like, that's just, it's the same. You know, I remember when Instagram changed their terms of use and, you know, it was like this big uproar and, you know, they changed it. And so like, it, it's the same like IP general, like hygiene type of things. Um, you know, with a side of like, yes, the law is evolving fast, but you can tell a bad set of terms of use, or at least I hope you're, you know, you train your team or have processes for that. Um, you know, you can tell those before AI, like, you know, we, we definitely, um, you know, I, I, like, for example, I mean, I hate to call them out, but does anybody use the consumer website house to, um, you know, with your pictures? Okay. If you read their terms of use, they can use your images in physical books. So the IP license is so broad that you post things on there, you give them a perpetual worldwide royalty free, et cetera, license. Um, and it extends to, which is pretty unusual um, for online platforms. Certainly, you know, your, your major ones wouldn't do that. But for them, you know, they're in the photography content basically business. And so that's, that's what they've done. So that's the kind of term that you would see even in a pre-AI world and be like, yeah, now you, if you want to use house, you should have like house specific images or, or what have you. I think uh, perhaps before we move on, Tam, just to round out this discussion, the, the issues we've discussed are over AI adoption, terms of use, copyright. Those are hot button issues. Uh, there are, it's like a law school exam uh, of potential other issues. <laughs> defamation issues. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed last week by an individual who says that OpenAI's ChatGPT spit out misinformation about him having committed a crime. And so he sued OpenAI for defamation. And, and that's, that's the case even though OpenAI and Google's tool and the other tools say, sorry, we're prone to hallucination. We're prone to make mistakes, almost saying, don't listen to us. So you've got the defamation issues and that's just that's just been filed. That's going to be get litigated. There are scraping CFAA issues, and that's really more a concern on on the part of the AI platform and tool, not for the in-house attorneys representing uh, 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 companies in different areas. Privacy issues, I believe we've touched on, um, and those are significant. Trade secrets, and that is what you share with the AI platforms. 
uh, what will they do with it? Could you destroy your company's trade secrets by sharing too much or sharing something with the AI tools? Uh, I think we talked, or you have touched on misinformation, disinformation, bias. Um, there was a lot of uproar when the DeSantis campaign showed pictures of former President Trump and Anthony Fauci hugging. I think those have been manipulated and created by AI. How many people believed that those were real hugs and real pictures? It's so easy for somebody to generate that. So there's misinformation, disinformation. I'll tell a very quick anecdote. For the lawyers, uh, for all the lawyers on this uh, on this uh, call, there you probably read in the legal trades a story about a, a, an attorney in Texas who was reprimanded because uh, they used AI to write part of part of a legal brief and didn't bother to check the legal citations and the cases didn't exist. And I actually personally tried that the other day. I had uh, uh, another AI tool. Uh, try to summarize California law on, on false advertising. And I knew the seminal cases and I wanted to see what new cases it might come up with. And it very confidently named two cases with F2D sites. I mean, they look like legitimate cases. It had a court, it had a year. I then sent it to my one of my colleagues and I said, I don't know if these are real cases, but take a look at these and cite them if they're relevant. <laughs> I got a response back the next morning, these cases don't exist. There are no cases at those citations. So there is a huge risk of, of misinformation, uh, bias and discrimination as well, and, and trademark issues. In trademark issues, there's one being litigated. Tam, you asked about litigation in the area. Getty, the, the uh, owner of, of various stock photography, has sued uh, Stability AI, uh, one of the image generating tools, because they, de they determined that Stability AI had trained on many Getty copyrighted images. And how do they know that? Well, they were able to get Stability AI to generate a photograph that actually had the Getty watermark on it. The problem is the, the image was heavily distorted, which didn't meet the standards of, and quality of a typical Getty image, and the watermark was distorted as well. And so, uh, if I can if I can quickly share my screen, I'd like to show the audience just that image. Can I have permission, please? Thank you. Does everybody see the image here? It's a it, it's a distorted image of two soccer players. You can see. Uh, AI tools are prone to hallucination. You can see their eyes, their fingers are all distorted. But this is an image that was generated by uh, stability, and you can still see the Getty Images watermark on there. Bobby, so, I'm sorry, I don't think I can see it. Oh, thank That's you for letting me know. Um, hmm. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It's last All right. Well, the audience will have to take my word for it. Uh, anyhow, that is one of the litigations that's ongoing. Uh, the complaint was just amended in that case. Oh, I think um, if we go back, that's the image, everybody. That is an image generated by stable uh, uh, stability AI. You can still see the Getty images watermark. So it's a copyright case because the image is substantially similar to a Getty image but it's also a trademark case so it's one of the first trademark cases involving uh ai output there are dmca issues uh the removal of copyright management information uh rights of publicity issues that's an issue i'm fascinated with so can you generate a song uh by drake and the weekend and put it out uh using ai the answer is <laughs> the answer was is no um, and as, as somebody quickly found out when they released a, a song that was quite good, that quickly went viral and then quickly was shut down by the music labels, I actually think that the strongest claim that the labels and artists would have ha had would have been a right of publicity violation, which prohibits the commercial use of one's name, image, likeness, or voice in a number of states. And so right of publicity is another issue that in-house counsel needs to be wary of.
Wow, that's um, really, really helpful, um, Bobby, going through all of the, the risk um, factors that we have to think about. It's a lot. Um, uh, this is a question from Mo. Um, Goldman Sachs recently did a comprehensive study on AI automation that estimates uh, two thirds of jobs in the US and Europe are exposed to some AI automation and that AI could substitute up to one quarter of um, current work. Is there any truth to the fear that machines will replace human workers? And, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? So, I mean, I think I've seen a lot of different studies over the last few months, um, and they, they vary wildly um, across the board from 20% like to like 60%. Um, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. But I do think that, like, personally, um, my, my thoughts are, these technologies will help with productivity, with efficiency. Um, they will help make lives easier. Um, will they replace certain types of like jobs that can be automated? Maybe, but I think they also will create opportunities that don't currently exist when it comes to um, AI, AI generation, um, and AI development. Um, and so I think it's like there's a balance or to look at. Um, so like I'm no expert in in the field to to know like like what what if any jobs will be um or will be impacted but but you know I I think that there are the the pros and the productivity and efficiency gains um that people will see um are going to outweigh the cons and I think that you know there will be an opportunity for new types of jobs coming out of you know, generative AI or AI just generally in, in the advancements made in the field. So um, I think it's just something to, uh, I don't I don't necessarily put too much weight on these articles just because I don't think anyone knows um, and it's a lot of conjecture, um, but it's something that's interesting and we'll just have to, to watch and, and see, you know, how everything plays out. Jitulia, um, <clears throat> what are the latest innovations uh, within AI that excite you most? Yeah, um, so probably three things. So one is just the compute is increasing tremendously. So we're gonna see the speed and power of these models uh, get better. Two is essentially now that there's these models are out there, there's a lot of really interesting work that's domain specific, right? So we've trained a model that is, I think a 10th the size of um, the other coding models but we've used essentially coding data from the Replit platform, and it is very similar in performance at a tenth the size. So you're going to see a lot of really hyper-specialized models, um, and it's gonna and it's gonna be great for whatever it is. Um, you might even see personal models specific to a company. So I mentioned, you know, the Nike legal department example. You know, maybe they train uh, a, a contracts AI specifically only on Nike contracts and build their own. So that's a that's a second trend that I'm super excited about. And then third is just, um, you know, this is a Maya Angelou quote, um, and this is one that uh, Jasper AI uses a lot. They are um, basically AI for marketing copy. And I went to, they had a Gen AI conference and they had the quote all over the place, which was cool. But essentially Maya Angelou says, creativity is not used up. Like the more you have it, the more it, it's sort of like, it's like love basically that it it continues to to increase. And so for me, like, you know, I, I mentioned I'm a wordsmith, all of you, your lawyers, you probably are, but having Grammarly or having Google Bard or ChatGPT or what have you, um, you know, even for things like product naming, I'm like, oh, give me some ideas for blah, 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 or a team name for whatever. And it just sort of like sparks things. Um, so I do think that the creative bar should get higher. Um, so that's also something that I'm quite excited about. Bobby, what are you excited about? I mean, everything. I'm excited to be involved in litigation, defending the <laughs> platforms, uh, I'm, uh, helping clients. Bill get paid. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, right now there's a big lawsuit that my colleague is ha handling at Cooley against Midjourney. It's threatening the model and, and, and its ability to train on, on publicly available data, whether or not that data might be eligible for copyright a protection and and so that's a threshold issue that's going to get answered by that case and a companion case that was filed against Microsoft and OpenAI and being involved in those cases is is thrilling and 
uh, I, I've always liked where technology outpaces the law just a little bit and then the law has to catch up. And I remember I've been practicing long enough that I remember the transition from brick and mortar to online during the, the dot boom and how everybody rushed to get dot com names. It felt like they had to. They had to add dot com to their name. If for those of you in the audience old enough to remember that, you didn't have a new company um, out there unless it had dot com after it. And I'm seeing that now all over again, except at a grander scale. I, I view this as the as important as the shift from brick and mortar to online and add in mobile to that. I mean, mobile has changed our lives too. Uh, and, and I think that this is tantamount to those. And now you're seeing a lot of companies rebrand themselves as AI companies. The same companies yesterday now are AI companies. And it's not a lie. It's not, it's not an exaggeration, but it's, an, it's really it's an opportunistic um, way of marketing themselves because a lot of companies use AI. So I'm excited to see where this is headed. Like Cecilia, I already use AI in my everyday life. I, I am pushing my firm. I'm on, a, um, I'm on a committee for AI development within the firm. I'm on various task forces. I want to find a way to safely train off of work product. And I'm not speaking for the firm when I say this. I just think this is inevitable. Train off of your attorney's best work product and in a closed environment, in a walled garden, so it's not leaking client data, maybe you scrub the, the data. Imagine if you could learn from the best writer's briefs, the best jurist opinions, and, and you're the one, you, your entity, your organization is the one training it. Imagine how good it would be. Imagine if you could train off of every letter you've written, it could write another letter in your style in a matter of seconds. And to me, that's exciting. I don't think that jeopardizes our jobs. I think it allows us to be more efficient. We always say, I wish we could clone this member of my team. I wish I, I wish there were three of me some days, especially as uh, like Chile, I have four kids. I'm being pulled in different directions. I wish there I had more time. Well, this enables you to work more productively. And I think that's something that we're gonna see introduced to the practice of law. Thank you. I can't believe the hour has come and gone, and I still have many more questions, but I'm certain the audience has some pressing questions as well. Um, I will turn it back to my colleague, Lauren, for the audience questions. Thanks so much, Tam, Mo, Cecilia, Bobby. That was a really interesting conversation. I have learned a lot, and I'm sure our, pan, our guests have as well. There's been a couple questions coming in. Uh, one is regarding training and learning. So how do we make sure, for example, college students still do their own work? How does a first year associate learn how to write that demand letter? So if you don't mind, I'll just take this one because I have I actually have a hard stop, but I um, want to at least answer one question. Um, so this this actually like is something that keeps me up at night too, because I have a three year old son and I'm very worried about like his cognitive abilities as he grows up and, you know, having these tools at, um, you know, just ready and there for him to use to, you know, write papers or I don't know any, I'm sure there'll be other like amazing use cases that'll come up where you can just have the, the computer do whatever it is that you should be doing cognitively. Um, so, so I do worry about that, but I, I strongly believe that there will be a, like new technologies that will account for that um, and, and new ways to kind of um, understand whether something is actually like generated by AI or not. Um, and so there will be like counter technologies that will help kind of identify these types of issues. And for like college students, you know, um, when I was in college, a very very long time ago um we had this like plagiarism program or like uh software that you would run papers through um to make sure that they weren't plagiarized i could see some sort of ai tool that's similar to that when it comes to like identifying whether something was generated by ai or not um and then of course i think just having assignments done in person in class is just another way to kind of um counter that potential risk, um, but it's definitely something that uh, I think is probably top of mind for many parents um, and, you know, educators. I, can I, Lauren, can I jump in with a story and answer that question to compliment? Sure. Uh, Mo said, uh, 
we had in an earlier presentation I did, we had ChatGPT write a story uh, uh, about a Seinfeld episode about George Costanza <laughs> using ChatGPT um, to get ahead. And, and ChatGPT <laughs> created a beautiful Seinfeld-esque episode where George uses ChatGPT, he gets a promotion, they can't believe how good his work is, and everybody wants to know how he did it. So he gets called into his boss's office, and the, his boss says, you've been doing an amazing job recently. We're so impressed with all this stuff that you're doing. Tell us how you tell us how you went about doing X, Y, and Z. And of course, he couldn't explain it because he had just typed it into ChatGPT, so he gets fired. This was a script or screenplay written by ChatGPT. I thought it was it's, it was very funny. <laughs> That's great. It's appropriate here. So I don't think it replaces. It obviously doesn't replace learning and training. And so I need my team to be able to write a very good cease and desist letter, a good demand letter, know how to respond to it know what cases to cite, know how to dissect it. Otherwise, they're not going to know whether ChatGPT has mm -hmm. generated a good letter of its own. So I think all of those will continue to be uh, building blocks of any attorney's career. I think it'll just be accentuated and maybe sped up with the use of technology. Because think about the way a lot of us who've been practicing for 20, 25 years have, have done things. If we, we think, have I done this before? Did I write this letter? Let me open that up and let me borrow from it. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And this might just be a different way of doing it. Thanks, Bobby. Mo, um, we will let you go. I know you have a hard stop. Thank you so much for your knowledge and wisdom that you've imparted today. Thank you. Um, following up, I have a follow-up question um, that was in regards to Bobby's example of writing the story about the dog who transports to another galaxy and just thinking about also, um, I guess, in a context of a college course where you're asked to all write the same, um, say, paper on the same subject. If the person, uh, the question came in, if that participant were to enter the exact same language into chat GPT regarding your story about the dog, would chat GPT um, output the exact same story? Uh, it's not supposed to. Um, it will and, be different every okay, time. Me, can, I, can I do a demo for this one too? Please. Yes. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, Chichili is pulling this up. There will be elements that are potentially in common but it's not supposed to be this exact same output all right so what that i did was I, during this webinar i wrote lawyer at her desk and enjoying an informative webinar while also having a sparkling water which i was doing at the public right now sun shining into the room photorealistic from the point of view of the camera brown hair red lipstick so it did pretty good but you'll see i can generate again and say you know blue lipstick and it'll be slightly different. So we just, we don't know what components it'll take. So in the in the story example, it, it's very like, so AIs are what's called non-deterministic. And like, that's what actually makes them bad for some tasks and search better, is that you actually don't know what you're gonna get. The, way, the comparison that I use is like, it's a smart college student that has read all of the internet and is a little over eager. So you see, this is like, it tried the blue lipstick, it got, this one just like really threw it off. The blue just like did not know. But the point is, is like you don't actually know what you're going to get and you can like actually, um, you know, basically like vary it a little bit each time. Um, and that's actually a, sort of a feature because it's a little more natural, but it's sort of the downside if you're expecting a search like experience or you're expecting like an actual case to be cited. Um, that's that's really interesting. Um, and I, I did have some questions about um, Concerns over compensation for use of AI generated content. Um, the AI's mo AI models, they draw, curate, reincorporate human work without permission from or compensation to the humans who created the original um, content. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? That's a, it's, Chichilia, do you wanna, do you wanna? No, go ahead, you go. That, that is a, it's a, it's a somewhat difficult question to answer. It's it's also it's also at the heart of some of the litigations that um, that we're handling. So I don't want to comment um, too broadly. Other than to say, I think everybody on, on this panel and in, in in the virtual room would agree. 
you can go to the library and if you have the capacity to, you could read every single book in there and you could learn from it. You could read every manual, you could look at every photograph and you would use it for inspiration. Nothing under the law prohibits you from learning off of copyrighted material. Uh, and some would argue that that's what the AI um, platforms are doing. They're just learning um, from what's out there. And whether it's copyright protected or not, it, it, it's fair use for the platform to do that. Th that is a position that a lot of the AI platforms are going to take and is being litigated. So in terms of compensation, I know that OpenAI came out last week, if I'm not mistaken, and said that in future iterations of OpenAI, they are going to limit its tool from creating, uh, I believe it was works in the style of living artists. And they were doing that, I think, in response to pushback from artists that their works were being you know, co-opted because uh, due to the tool. Uh, whether other platforms follow suit remains to be seen, but I think OpenAI's change may have been in reaction to some of the pushback from creators who believe that their works are being um, appropriated. Now, what's important to come back to, and the copyright lawyer in me feels obliged to say this, uh, the what something trains on is, is, is one, one potential issue. What courts are focusing on more is what comes out. And what if what comes out of the AI tool looks like your photograph, Chichilia's software code, et cetera, then that will be subject to traditional copyright infringement analysis, which, which asks, is there substantial similarity? So I know that wasn't a direct answer to the question, but that's my attempt. Chichilia, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think what Bobby is is saying just reinforces what I said, which is like the application of law from precedent is not different, right? So in the example that Bobby gave, you can go to a library. Yeah, you can't break in up my house and read my diary and create something from my diary. So, you know, or similarly for a corporation, Apple doesn't let you get within 50 feet of the building if you don't work there. So, um, you know, there's definitely those kinds of like the access and substantial similarity test, like the access is clear. And if you don't want access, then you have to be careful how you license your stuff, right? So we're an online coding platform and we allow you, you know, it's default MIT license for open source when you actually use our free product, but it's an incentive to use the pay product that you wouldn't actually, that you would have essentially the private environment. Big deal in an enterprise space. If some of you work in enterprise, I noticed um, some of the attendees were from pharma. You know, obviously having like a virtual private cloud and protecting your data, you know, it's the reason we're using, you know, go to meeting here, like enterprise are a little more secure. And I would put law firms, you know, in, in that bucket, right? But ultimately, I think, you know, the, the people who innovate and figure out how to learn from your own stuff and generate is going to be a big deal. Now, is there room for something creative the way that, you know, iTunes came out, right? Because I remember I was in college when there was Napster, right? We had, you know, communal servers for every song you could ever want um, on Napster. I didn't personally participate, but there were definitely people that did and not people that are like, oh, they're criminals or whatever. It's just literally like iPhone, or I'm sorry, iTunes, where you could actually um, legitimately license music didn't exist. And so you can imagine someone, you know, Andy Warhol or, you know, a living artist and Geds, you can do and Getty's baby pictures or whatever in these things being like, okay, you know, you want something in the style of Ann Gettys, then I get a cut. So it's very similar analysis. Those of us who came up in tech trans, it's the same analysis as before, where it's like worldwide royalty free in all mediums. Okay, this is a medium. But if you actually, you know, Netflix, I was talking to a lawyer from Netflix, you know, they slice and dice. It's the bundle of sticks metaphor for IP, right? You slice and dice that many ways. You can imagine, you know, for AI training being one of the bundles that gets looked at similar to an offline distribution online, the house example for books that I mentioned. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. And Cecilia, I know you mentioned earlier in our presentation that um, you don't think like kind of like the doom and gloom of AI will result in, you know, people losing their jobs. And um, I wanted to, we had a question uh, 
focused on the legal um, field. And this person asked, a friend who is an equity partner predicts that legal research will be performed completely by AI and replace junior associates within one year. Um, predictions on this, do you think this will, if and when this might, something like this might happen, both in legal and maybe like in a broader kind of context of roles such as research? Yeah, I mean, look, like I was in law school and my first year of law school when we did LRW, legal research and writing, like they were still debating if they should show us the books, like the like pull this down. And like we had like the Lexus rep and the Westlaw rep in the room and whatever. And it was like, I think they like did a college try and showed us the books like once. Did I ever use the books? Like, no, that's ridiculous. Why would I do that? And so like, you know, did that get rid of first years? You know, no. Like I do as as a GC, do I not love first years on my matter sometimes? Like, yeah, I mean, it's sort of annoying, but it's really more about like which first year. Because I think the first years tend to use these tools more and actually like for some of the tech forward stuff that I'm working on can actually, um, you know, be better in some ways. And so I don't, right. I mean, a year, a year is going to be going to be too fast. Like, there's too many live big litigations or matters, but I do think firms that are that are forward about it will will win more business. I also, you know, I think, as I mentioned before, I think it will accelerate the trend of, of in-house doing more, um, you know, but I, I think you just, again, you just have to get better with AI, get better at research. Julia, you've just dated me. I actually use those books in law Did school. You? Yeah, well, I, I see that. And like now, I'm like I, you want them in your office to like look smart and all that. But, but no, anyway. we actually we actually had to use them. <laughs> really? Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. No, I mean, I, it was like that. Oh, you know, and and I think we, you know, when I think back to undergrad, we didn't have Wi-Fi in the classroom, so I'm like, okay. okay. Well, I had to use. Uh, not just you know the full sets right because there are supplements that come every year or six months or whatever so that was the complicating part right so you find it in the books and then you had to go look at the supplements and then you had this huge massive you know table full of books out yeah no we were taught that we had to do it that was sort of yeah exciting <laughs> this was so Bobby? fun i love this stuff yeah I could talk about it. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, and fortunately, we're at 15 minutes past the hour. I mean, I, I think this is fascinating as well. And um, I think we should reconvene with everyone in a year and kind of see where AI has taken us. And it would be really interesting to get this group back together and, and um, kind of make this uh, an annual event. I'm sure things will be so different a year from now than what they look like um, today. Um, so I just want to thank you um, to Chilia, Bobby, Mo, Tam for moderating. This was, again, an excellent conversation, and I hope um, everyone got a lot out of it. And we will be sending out a video of the presentation as well. We're sending a link to, um, to the recording so you can watch it. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can follow up with us um, from the email. And thank you again for engaging everyone. Thank you so much for your time. And I um, hope everyone has a, a great day. Thanks, all. Thank you, Lauren. Thank Thanks, you everybody. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, Tim. Thank Thanks, Lauren. Bye. See you next year.